All right, so welcome everyone. So today, um, Dr. Rachel Duzant, the North Region Clinical Director, Dr. Don Racinos, the South Region Clinical Director, Dr. Diana Turner, the West Region Clinical Psychologist, and myself, the West Region Clinical Director, are going to discuss mental health diagnoses and some key components to help you gain familiarity with major mental health diagnoses, identify essential target behaviors for the presenting mental health concerns, um, work in coordination with prescribers, and to identify appropriate referrals for um, individuals presenting needs. So the reason actually that we picked this topic was because it was re requested directly by you about a year ago um, because of its relevance in PRC and in behavior planning. So keep in mind that this is a very brief overview of a lot of mental health conditions um, to help you as behaviorists, case managers, nurses, and other DDS team members. If there are specific areas you'd like more information about in the future, please let us know. You can email us directly or we'll share a link afterward to a survey um, where you can, you know, put in feedback, questions, or future suggestions. Okay. So, you know, before we start on the content, um, I wanted to mention the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, 5th edition. Um, we refer to this as the DSM-5. This is the primary manual that we are using for diagnosing mental health disorders in the U.S. Um, of course, there will be some changes in the next edition coming up in March. Um, so the DSM-5-TR will be coming out in March and will replace this current manual. Um, we know while there are a number of changes in March, I do want to bring one to your attention today. Um, the diagnosis of intellectual disability will actually be replaced with intellectual developmental disorder. So ID will be replaced with IDD. So we'll no longer use the term disability and we'll move to developmental disorder. So heads up on that. Now, many times teams are looking up information online about diagnoses. There are many, many websites that are not accurate. So we do wanna share with you just a few quality sources. Um, one is the American Psychiatric Association, which wrote the DSM-5 um, or compiled it, I should say. Um, the website is psychiatry.org. The National Institutes of Health um, is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services website, which compiles really helpful overviews of diagnoses, the current evidence-based treatments um, to help you understand, you know, what's what's current in the literature. And then finally, Hippocrates.com is a very useful um, reference for medications. So you can use that website to look up current FDA approved ranges, side effects, black box warnings for behavior modifying medications. Uh, we often recommend that teams use this site to complete their consent forms for their psych meds. If you're like me and you don't like to be surprised or caught off guard at PRC, you definitely want to use this website. Now, you know, as we go into the different disorders in the DSM, um, I want to mention that this this heading of neurocognitive disorder um, covers quite a few different disorders. So I'm only going to hit on some of the primary headings that we think about within the IDD population. Um, the two that I'm going to hit on today are delirium and then the mild and major neurocognitive disorder. Now, remember that these are not due to the intellectual developmental disorder. In contrast, IDD is a neurodevelopmental disorder because it's thought to begin in early life whereas neurocognitive disorders can have onset anytime. Now, delirium has a rapid onset. It's linked to a medical condition that's generally acute. This may completely resolve when the condition resolves. So for example, delirium can be caused by dehydration. In such a case, there would be impaired attention, a lack of awareness. Additionally, the person may mm. have either poor orientation to who they are or where they are, they may have um, new speech problems, new memory problems, or even a perceptual disturbance, meaning the person is suddenly seeing, hearing, or feeling things that aren't there. Now, once the dehydration condition resolves, the person no longer experiences the delirium and then returns to baseline. This means they would no longer have a diagnosis of delirium. Now, mild and major neurocognitive, neurocognitive disorders are impairments um, that you know, or can occur at various levels of functioning at any time in, in one's age. There are always underlying causes, um, and those causes can range from HIV to various dementias. So each cause for the neurocognitive disorder may have different associated features. 
For example, Lewy body dementia tends to be associated with fluctuating cognition, attention, and alertness. It often includes visual hallucinations with significant detail, and people tend to have Parkinsonianism movement about a year or so after the cognitive impairment sets in. Um, finally, sleep disorders and sensitivity to neuroleptic medications are very common as well. So, you know, because of this, be sure to look into the typical associated features of the presenting cause of the neurocognitive disorder, as they can give you important behavioral information to help the person. Remember that getting a baseline is extremely important in dementia. We want to know the individual's functioning level compared to baseline so we can see how far the disorder has progressed and then provide the proper care in light of that. Some interventions and medications don't make sense at certain stages in the illness, so the baseline really helps um, guide treatment. Now, when it comes to getting a baseline, um, I mentioned here the NTG EDSD, which is a screening tool in the public domain. It's fairly easy to administer and it offers the team a tool to monitor changes over time. You might want to you know, do it at the IP each year um, just to keep yourself um, up to date on, on the baseline and the progress in the illness. Um, it's particularly helpful for people at risk of developing dementia due to age or condition. So people with Down syndrome are more likely to develop early onset dementia. And it's recommended that you begin to administer the NTG EDSD at age 45 in people with Down syndrome. Now, even if the person already has a dementia diagnosis, monitoring the decline with a standardized measure is valuable for treatment planning and as an additional data point for the gerontologist and neurologist working with the individual. So um, it doesn't hurt. Now, you know, part of of why we're doing this presentation is to help equip you with some of the behavioral considerations for each of the disorders, because we understand that, you know, many of you are behaviorists and you're trying to assist the person as much as possible while not diagnosing, yet you wanna understand what, you know, the diagnoses mean um, and, and major areas of need for them. So that's what we're gonna emphasize today is, is getting into the behavioral considerations once you have a, a context of the disorder. So let's discuss um, behavior supports for people with dementia. Um, this is a slide you, you might want to reference in the future. Um, some highlights are emphasizing healthy behaviors because that will help slow down the progression of the illness and reduce the likelihood of an acute medical concern. Um, health includes eating enough healthy food to get necessary nutrients like fiber even. Um, hydration is very important. Sleep hygiene, getting exercise, like walking, yoga, swimming, stretching. Um, and then using the brain to do puzzles or activities that require some level of problem solving or novel thinking. You wanna build in as much structure as possible so the schedule for the person is predictable. This is very helpful as the memory and awareness gradually decline so the person has as much awareness of their surroundings as possible. This is gonna reduce distress, fear, and agitation. So, you know, as you think about this, holidays and weekends can be particularly challenging because schedules tend to shift. So remember to build in constants like maintaining the same sleep schedule and eating times whenever possible, especially around those holidays and weekends. You really want to keep the environment as low in stress as possible. You know, keep the news off the television. Um, I, I really thought this picture here, right? You see the trees gradually losing their leaves. I thought it was a great illustration of dementia because it's a progressive disorder that worsens over time. Um, someone who used to be able to handle a more complex direction may now need things simplified. Make sure that staff are aware of this and they adjust their approach and expectations. Depending on the type of dementia, some people will have periods of clarity. So be sure to give clear education so um, people who work with them don't assume that they're faking or get into a pattern of blaming the individual. The progression does not look the same in everyone. And also remember, there are significant differences between types of dementia. So do take the time to look into, um, you know, research the specific type. Now, when it comes to Alzheimer's dementia, you're more likely to see sundowning. Sundowning is confusion and distress in the evenings as darkness falls. Many people get loud and agitated, and to reduce this, it can be helpful to maintain brightness in the evenings because shadows can in increase the distress related to sundowning. There's also a theory that sundowning is related to circadian dysrhythm. Um, it's not proven, but Proactively ensuring the individual gets adequate exposure to sunlight early in the day is generally good for sleep and health, and it could also reduce that distress um, with the sundowning. So, you know, it doesn't hurt. 
And finally, when the individual is distressed, you know, of course, do not attempt to reason with them. You know, it's, it's more helpful to say okay and then redirect them to something else that can be used as a distraction. If that other activity is calming or positively engaging, that'll work out best. So, you know, please encourage caregivers to be as flexible as possible. Um, if an individual tends to have rough evenings, um, move their so, uh, their shower schedule, you know, to the mornings if possible. So try to, to build their schedule in at the times when they do best during the day. Now, when talking about dementia, um, you know, of course, I want to mention Down syndrome. You know, people with Down syndrome are more likely to have early onset dementia, as we mentioned, um, and many develop dementia in their late 40s or early 50s. Um, so you want to think about catching it early, um, catching the progression, if at all possible, early on. Um, another important thing to consider um, in those with Down syndrome is that after they develop dementia, they are actually more likely to start having seizures, um, even if they never had a seizure disorder prior. Um, in fact, 70 to 80 percent of people with comorbid Down syndrome and dementia develop epilepsy. Another thing to keep in mind is that there are several mental health and medical conditions that are common in people with Down syndrome. Um, later, we're going to talk about sleep apnea too, which is highly relevant. So um, lastly, you know, as we close on Down syndrome, I want to mention self-talk, which is um, private speech. And this is extremely common in people with Down syndrome. Um, what does that look like? They may use self-talk to work out situations, express inner feelings, or just to entertain themselves. Um, be sure to assess before assuming that the person has a psychotic disorder or they're talking to someone that isn't there, or, you know, having some kind of a medical delirium. Um, one study found that self-talk was present in 91% of people with Down syndrome. So, you know, think about that in context, how prevalent that is. Um, usually self-talk is understandable. The individual uses a normal tone. Um, they typically are talking to themselves, but they may also involve a real or imaginary person um, or a favorite toy or an object. The content can be an event that recently occurred or was expected to occur. It could be a TV um, program or a movie, friends or family, um, completing an activity or, or just complaining about various things. Um, so remember, it, you know, it has it can serve as a positive outlet for the person to plan or rehearse an activity um, to work out a problem or just a self dialogue about something that the person is interested in. Now, as we conclude neurocognitive disorders, I'm going to hand the baton to Dr. Duzant, who will speak to you about thought disorders. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. So I wanted to give you a concrete example of what Dr. Lloyd was just talking about in regards to self-talk and how you may write up an operational definition for it if you were putting that in a behavioral support plan, for example. Just this week in PRC, for example, this came up where an author wrote a self-talk operational definition as any time the person speaks out loud to absent people or themselves, the team feels that it is how she processes through a difficult situation or memory with absent people, an external dialogue to work through how she feels. This may take the form of singing to them, expressing multiple voices with different tones, or processing a situation out loud to herself. This does not appear to be a hallucination as opposed to how she deals with her feelings. So that could be a concrete example of how you might express how a person is talking to themselves that isn't relevant to having an actual psychotic disorder. So when we're thinking about schizophrenia, spectrum disorders, and other psychotic disorders, we usually typically think about the positive symptoms that are observable, such as the hallucinations. But there is a triad of symptoms that you can use when you're actually tracking behavioral data. So if you have an individual in your caseload with a psychotic disorder, you may want to use this triad of symptoms for tracking the effectiveness of medications, your behavioral support plan, or any of the other treatments that the person may be enrolled in. So you're looking at positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. And we're going to go through each one briefly. So in regards to positive symptoms related to schizophrenia, 
Um, when we think of these symptoms, um, positive doesn't mean that it's pleasant to the person per se at all. Think of positive symptoms as something added to the person's typical experiences that others do not share in the experience of having it. So when you think about that, you think about hallucinations, for example, who can, all hallucinations um, can impact your senses. So you're talking about your um, auditory hallucinations where people are seeing, um, hearing things that other people can't actually hear themselves visual hallucinations where a person is able to see things that other people cannot see, olfactory hallucinations where a person is experiencing, um, you know, actually smelling things that doesn't seem to be the tactile, they're feeling things that are not there, gustatory, they're tasting things that are not there. And also just to let you know, so when you think about sensations, you should think about proprioceptive and vestibular because there are times where someone who's psychotic may experience themselves as outside of their body, for example, if you were to ask them to um, explain how they're um, experiencing things. So in regards to auditory hallucinations, the most common of the positive symptoms, it's associated with a risk if it's command in nature. So you want to be mindful of that. Um, please be advised that tactile hallucinations very very rare in schizophrenia and typically when you see that in like an acute um, onset of tactile hallucinations typically is associated with things such as a substance abuse history um, where someone's toxic on a substance, they're withdrawing, or they're currently intoxicated. Other things that you can look for um, in terms of positive symptoms or delusions, false beliefs that are not true, paranoia, ideas of reference, which a person would find significance to themselves, to other things in the environment, thought broadcasting, where they believe that um, their thoughts are being broadcasted to other people, and loose associations, which, you know, um, loose associations can be confused with thought broadcasting, but they're making associations to things that don't typically go together. So in regards to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, there are other causes that can make a person hallucinate. So you want to rule out those variables before you start tracking it as quote unquote hallucinations. So for example, I have a list of multiple things that um, basically can create hallucinations and gave you some examples of um, what type of hallucinations it can generate. But lack of sleep and insomnia, dementia, as Dr. Lloyd had mentioned, migraines, for example, that's when people are also experiencing floaties, et cetera. Um, substance abuse problems, of course, um, that's where the tactile hallucinations come in. Of most relevance, particularly at this time of the pandemic, where so many people are grieving and mourning the loss of others, sometimes people can experience hearing loved ones' voices, seeing loved ones, et cetera. You really need to rule out cultural variables in regards to whether or not that is relative, relevant to their culture, their religious beliefs, et cetera, um, because it may not actually be a psychotic process. Damage to one's brain and epilepsy can cause some um, experiences of hallucination. Of course, side effects to certain medications. Deficiencies in vitamins, for example, B12 is definitely one of those um, vitamins that can cause um, someone to look as if they are psychotic. Diseases of the ear, so diseases of the middle, inner ear, where someone can experience hearing things. Strokes delirium, as Dr. Lloyd mentioned, auditory nerve disease, central nervous disorders, optic nerve disorders, which can, you know, um, do a number on visual perceptions, and then Parkinsonian's disease. So negative symptoms. When we're thinking about negative symptoms in this triad of symptoms, I want you to think about what has been taken away or subtracted from the person's experience. So previously, the person had a lot of motivation. Now they're no longer experiencing it. They used to show you a range of affect, and now all you see is flat affect. They used to have interest in many things. Now there's no interest. There's a lack of pleasure in the things they used to enjoy. Or they used to be more socially interested in others, and now they're no longer interested. Although the positive symptoms are associated with a person being hospitalized, the negative symptoms can significantly impact the person's overall functioning, the way they relate to each other, their initiative and the way they reach out and their learning process. 
So please be mindful of potentially tracking those negative symptoms as a sign of um, treatments and whether or not they're working or not. So our cognitive symptoms. Um, now this is a little bit difficult, particularly with IDD in that the cognitive symptoms look like disorganized thought processes, right? So persons having a hard time um, with the way they think and how their thoughts are coming together and being organized. They may experience some neologisms, word salads, um, limited ability to plan in a stepwise fashion, and also kind of mingling true memories with delusions. So the cognitive symptoms that impact a person's speech, their social interactions and processing of information all lead to sometimes poor decision making, which is further compounded if they have an intellectual disability. So the process of thinking is disrupted and that the person is more distracted, incoherent at times and unable to explain their position. So when you're tracking symptoms related to cognitive symptoms, think about how the person used to talk when they were taking their medications more compliant. Were they goal directed? Were they not? Were they tangential um, when they are not on their medications? And do they have words that's just unique to them? And it has nothing to do with it being a psychotic process. You have to keep all of those things in mind. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment and changes. DSM-5 no longer carries the previous classifications related to paranoia, disorganized, catatonic, undifferentiated, or residual in regards to classifications for schizophrenia. But the treatments for it can range from cognitive rehab, antipsychotics, individual and group therapies, social support, structure, ECT, and building trust. Please keep in mind that some of the antipsychotics that are used and the medications we use in general may impact other vitamin levels, et cetera, that can disrupt the person's ability to kind of function in general. And it may then also lead to some mood components. So just keep that in mind. For example, some of the medications can impact the person's zinc level, and that can then have implications for mood, which Dr. Lloyd will talk about a little more. Of most importance, um, rule out things that are reversible. Dr. Lloyd talked about um, delirium. Delirium is reversible. Vitamin deficiencies and acute onset of psychosis um, if it's acute, there may be a way that it can be re reversed. For example, if it's due to substances, et cetera. So other issues you need to worry about, particularly with psychotic disorders, is something called metabolic syndrome due to the medications and weight gain associated with the medications we give to treat the diagnoses, psychomotor side effects. So this is why we're asking for AIM screenings and making sure TD is not an issue, and then lab abnormalities as well as catatonia. So those are just some things to consider and think about. Dr. Lloyd, I'm going to pass the um, baton back to her for her to have a discussion about mood disorders, because there are times where a person may have a diagnosis called schizoaffective disorder, or a person may have a mood disorder with psychotic features, et cetera, and that really um, plays a part in how you would treat it and how you would track the behavior and how you would actually go to help someone get through that rough time. Dr. Lloyd? Thank you so much. So, yes, um, you know, before we talk specifically about mood disorders, I did want to um, go through the depression to mania scale. I think this is really helpful um, context to understand uh, how to think about each of these um, types of disorders. So um, all mood disorder diagnoses hinge on the severity of um, the items that you're seeing on this screen. Um, so this line represents mood fluctuations within the normal range. OK, we have times when we're happy, when we're feeling joy, um, there's an occasion or event or a moment that brings a positive mood. Right. And then, um, you know, perhaps our baseline is in that kind of light orange range of general contentment, euthymia. Um, then there are events or moments that make our mood not so great, like sadness, disappointment. Um, it could even be like grief or loss. So, you know, we've collectively gone through some isolative and challenging times during this pandemic. Um, so certainly relevant to to norm for normal to dip and flow, um, you know, within that range. 
Now, this other line here um, represents someone with bipolar one disorder. Um, so they're going to experience intense mood shifts from full manic episodes to full major depressive episodes. Um, this line, you know, represents those fluctuations as it dips from blue to red. Now, the intensity of the fluctuations will tell you the type of mood disorder. So with major depression, um, the person is only having depressive episodes, no climbing into the hypomania or the mania. Um, but during the major depressive episodes, they're in that dark blue. And then when they come out of the depressive episode, they may climb as high as the peach until like the doing well, doing okay zone. But with bipolar, depending on the type, the episodes may go from major depression up to mania or hypomania. Now we'll talk more about that in another illustration of that, but I thought this visual was a good context to understand those mood disorders and how they fluctuate. Um, so now that we have that context, now let's get into the nuts and bolts of what each um, disorder episode looks like. Now, a depressive episode, um, which, you know, again, is that dark blue from the last slide, um, would look like this, the content here. I find the mnemonic to be really helpful to just quickly recall the symptoms if you need them. Um, so SIG ECAPS, it includes all those symptoms. I like to say MSIG because really you want to have that depressed mood or loss of interest in pleasure before you even look at the, the SIG ECAPS criteria. Um, so if this helps you, great. You know, if you don't, if it's a lot to take in, that's fine too. Um, but just keep in mind that in order to have a diagnosis of major depression, the person must never have had a manic episode or a hypomanic episode. So this is like in their whole history. This is why this, the prescribers really want to look at history carefully um, before they decide on a medication. Um, this also means that major depression cannot be diagnosed at the same time as bipolar or schizoaffective disorder. Okay. Now, some possible presentations in people with major depressive episodes behaviorally are going to look like, you know, crying, changes in appetite and sleep, irritability, um, agitation and aggression, tiredness, lethargy. Those are some of the kind of general symptoms. And then if you pay attention to those thinking patterns, you're going to see some negative beliefs about the past, present, and future, um, some feelings of worthlessness or, or feeling that they're unlovable. This is very prevalent. You're going to see perceptions of helplessness and hopelessness. This is a big predictor, predictor actually of suicidality and that hopelessness. So pay close attention to this one. Um, you're going to see loss of enjoyment, um, possibly um, some thoughts about suicide, mm -hmm. um, being more easily distracted, movements mm -hmm. slowing down. Um, and some of those underlying emotions um, tend to be sadness, guilt, you know, which is feeling bad about something the person's done, or despair. Um, despair is a very powerful emotion that demonstrates a lack of hope. So again, you know, that hopelessness and despair is a really powerful influence toward thoughts of escape of those painful emotions through suicides. Pay close attention to that. Now, the content of a manic episode, what does that look like? Um, again, that was that bright red section from the other slide. So a manic episode is a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, um, expansive or irritable mood. Um, and they also have to have persistent, abnormally persistent goal-directed behavior or energy. Um, so to be a manic episode, it has to last for at least a week, and the symptoms have to be present most of the day, nearly every day, unless they had to be hospitalized because of it. In that case, you don't have to make it last a whole week. Um, so, you know, hypomania is similar, except the symptoms only have to last for four days instead of a whole week. So it's just a less severe, um, you know, intensity. Now, this mnemonic for mania is dig fast, which... I thought was a great illustration. Um, the person must have three or more of these symptoms here in the dig fast mnemonic alongside that mood disturbance and the increased energy and activity. So it is extremely important to identify mania or hypomania. Um, the prescriber will not want to miss an episode or a history. Um, for example, if they miss that the person had a manic or a hypomanic episode like 10 years ago and they then prescribe an SSRI for depression, um, SSRIs have been known to induce a manic episode. So furthermore, not adequately treating a person who has a manic or hypomanic episodes can lead to all the problems that come with that, right? Elopements, legal problems, aggression, and, you know, the aftermath. So when you see a shift in the person's mood to become more elevated or irritable, 
and they have more energy, you really want to get out your dig fast mnemonic and evaluate whether those symptoms are there and, and get them, you know, seen by a prescriber or a um, diagnostician. So, you know, most of these symptoms are, are self-explanatory, but I'll highlight just a few. Um, when the person has a dip in sleep, and keep in mind they have to, they don't need to take naps to make up for it, because if they're taking naps, then, you know, it doesn't really count as, as a deficit in sleep. Um, that is a telltale sign of a manic episode. Activities or hypomanic. Activities can look like um, coming up with new goals. Um, when a person whose goal-directed behavior is getting access to electronics to elope, um, that's certainly a goal, right? And, and it can lead to um, some problematic behavior. There are periods of stability, and then there are periods of constant attempts, you know, to access items. Um, and the elopements could also be indicative of thoughtlessness, right? The T, um, because it's a risky behavior to elope and then engage in, you know, sexual indiscretion with strangers, for example. So, you know, think about it in terms of, of how behaviors play out um, and, and be sure to, um, to look at it from the context of, of whether that's, there's a mood disorder component. Um, so we will talk more in a bit about target behaviors to use to track these symptoms. Now, you know, we discussed major depressive um, symptoms earlier, but here are some specifiers just to keep in mind. Um, just like hypomania is a less severe version of mania, PDD is a less severe version of major depression. It's, it used to be called dysthymia, now it's called persistent depressive disorder. So persistent depressive disorder means the person has a depressed mood for most of the day, for more days than not for at least two years. Um, they may have a lift in symptoms for up to two months in a row, but generally most of the year they're feeling depressed, okay? As always, they cannot have a manic or a hypomanic episode in their history to be diagnosed with, with this depressive disorder. Um, the symptoms are a lot like depression, but um, a couple exceptions are they do not include suicidality or the lack of interest in just daily activities, um, but all the other symptoms are the same as depression. So, you know, this is a list of disorders under the heading of bipolar. Um, remember, just like the thought disorders Dr. Duzant discussed, substance use can also induce a bipolar episode. So some substances that induce bipolar include alcohol, hallucinogens, benzos, antidepressants, like we mentioned earlier, and heart medications. So once the person stays off the substance for a month or so, then usually these resolve. Um, some people will develop a full-blown bipolar disorder even after they get off of the substances, so pay attention to that. Now, um, I figured, you know, as we talk about the different types of bipolar, it would be easiest to provide a visual um, when clarifying the differences, um, you know, in those. So, as you see, the green bipolar one, this means the person has both the major depressive episode and the full manic episode. And then if you look at bipolar two in purple, they have a major depressive episode and a hypomanic episode. And then finally, cyclothymia means they have hypomania, but they don't have a full-blown major depressive episode. They might have the, the persistent depressive disorder. So I thought this was helpful um, just to have a visual of, of how it looks and, and how you differentiate these disorders so you can communicate with those prescribers and understand um, what they're talking about. Now, you know, a few insights, you know, about different behaviors that you want to target and the patterns that you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> these are some principles just to keep in mind for people suffering with bipolar. Um, bipolar disorders are cyclical, meaning you'll notice a pattern through your data of cyclical spikes in irritability, impulsivity, um, depressed mood, sleep disturbance, things like that. So this is a significant indicator of a mood disorder when you see those cycles. Um, be sure to communicate with the prescriber about your data and these observations. Um, many people have cycles that follow seasonal patterns, so pay attention to that too. Um, sleep is definitely relevant for all mood disorders. It is essential to track sleep and get as accurate a data as possible. This can tell you whether a person is entering a mood episode, so you can work with the prescriber to address the concerns. Now, a person's perspective on their mood is important. Um, you wanna use various techniques to help the individual track mood when possible. It could be personal um, rating journals that they're tracking themselves. You can also have staff prompt the individual to rate their mood on a scale. Um, and then they can use like a, a phone or a tablet mood tracker app. There are lots of really great apps so the person can personally track um, how they're feeling. So you can you know, keep your finger on the pulse of, of the mood component. All right, so we're going to move out on mood disorders. 
And now we're going to move into um, some of the, the major sleep-wake disorders. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on here is insomnia. Um, you know, there are a number of disorders, but the one we see most often in our population is insomnia. So, you know, as you think about insomnia, think of it as hyperarousal. So it's a state of hyperarousal when we're supposed to be in hypoarousal when sleeping. Um, typically, you know, we can get by on as little as five and a half hours of sleep. Um, and again, it doesn't hurt if sleep is interrupted. So sleep loss can be made up with naps. So once you go below about five and a half hours of combined sleep in a day, um, our daytime functioning tends to suffer. Sleep disturbances contribute to problems in many systems of our body, including mood, attention, our ability to handle stress, behavior problems, and general health problems. There are three types of insomnia. There's trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, or waking up too early and being un unable to go back to sleep. Now, in order to be diagnosed, the problems have to occur at least three nights a week, and they have to cause significant impairment during the day. Um, there are multiple factors that can contribute to insomnia. Um, some are in our control and some are not. So people can be genetically predis predisposed to insomnia. So like if you're type A and you tend to overthink things, you may have more trouble falling asleep because it's hard to get out of that hyper aroused state. Um, there also can be environmental factors, right? Like a stressful event can cause sleep loss. If you have a problem and you can't stop thinking about it, it's hard to relax and go to sleep. Um, or maybe once you get to sleep, you wake up worried. And then finally, there are behaviors that can perpetuate insomnia. So this is where, you know, we want to focus, right, on our behavioral interventions that can help have an impact on reducing sleep um, wake disorder of insomnia. So um, we do not, you know, want to rely only on, you know, melatonin or trazodone, for example, without also building in some healthy patterns to get the person um, the best chance possible at eventually discontinuing those sleep medications. It's important to promote relaxation at the end of the day to ensure good sleep so the individual is ready to get out of that hyperarousal state and, and calm down and, and get into hypoarousal. Um, keep in mind that um, hyperarousal at the end of the day will prevent them from relaxing and not relaxing um, blocks them from lowering their core body temperature because that needs to happen in order for us to go to sleep or that, that our body kind of slow downs and slows down and goes into more of like a hibernation sort of um, setting. So daytime preparation is the key for good nighttime sleep. Um, you need to have enough serotonin flowing to naturally produce melatonin for sleep. You know, as we, when we take melatonin, we're, we're giving our body an external source rather than our body naturally producing it. And sometimes it can tell the body that we don't need as much natural melatonin um, when we're getting it, you know, externally. So it can set you up to depend on that medication. So we don't want to, um, you know, neglect doing some things during the day to help the body naturally produce it. So some techniques that help get that serotonin production up are heavy exercise in the afternoon, like doing things that involve muscles. Um, outdoor time, including natural sunlight in the early afternoon and morning, um, because the sunlight assists the serotonin production and it ensures the body is properly oriented to daytime and nighttime. You know, screen time, I'm sure you've heard about this. Um, screen time tells the body it's day, so it prevents the sleep delta brain waves and instead promotes alert delta brain wave patterns, even if the individual is falling asleep while watching, right? So if we're using um, phones or tablets and the individuals are um, using those, you know, it's a really easy fix to set them to night mode automatically. So it just comes on after dinner and then it won't show you the lights that tell you it's, it's daytime. Um, so if possible, uh, you do want to, you know, use the, the night mode on the screens and stay away from the television that we can't, you know, switch to night mode. Maybe new ones can, I haven't heard of that, but you can tell me later if that's the case. Um, so, you know, I mentioned a lower core body temperature, right? And so it needs to lower by about two or three degrees to fall asleep and to go into our deep sleep. Our body naturally does this as it winds down, but there are some behaviors that can assist. For example, a warm bath or a shower before bed actually lowers the core body temperature. Another obvious <laughs> assistance is a fan or a window AC unit to keep the bedroom nice and cool. Now you want to keep it as dark as possible because the eyes um, sensing light actually decreases melatonin production and tells the body that it's daytime. And then finally, you do want to reduce um, any light touch input 
when the goal is relaxation because being touched lightly actually increases our alertness, whereas deep pressure helps to relax and soothe. So some possible ways to achieve that are having the individual wear tighter pajamas um, or keeping heavy blankets on the bed to put that pressure um, on, against their skin as they're um, preparing for bedtime. Now, you know, as we um, conclude sleep disorders, I do want to mention a breathing related sleep disorder that we um, see so often in our population, sleep apnea. Um, it is so pervasive in IDD and it's such an impairing condition. So, you know, we mentioned Down syndrome earlier. Sleep apnea is higher, highly prevalent among people with Down syndrome, so much so that you're going to see it more often than not when a person has Down syndrome. Now, sleep apnea can affect so many systems of the body. It increases blood pressure. It can increase risk of type 2 diabetes, heart attacks, stroke, metabolic syndrome, and liver problems. Um, keep in mind that these are also risk factors for people that take antipsychotic medications, which many of our individuals do. Um, so we definitely want to be paying attention to the presence of sleep apnea because we don't want to duplicate those risks and um, you know, identify treatments and reach out for those treatments whenever possible. Now, you know, we often think immediately of a CPAP, right? When we think of, of, um, of sleep apnea, but um, there are other options. Um, there are dental appliances where some specific types of obstructive sleep apnea can be treated with a dental appliance. Um, there are also implantable devices. Um, there's the BPAP and the ASV, which are machines that are kind of like a CPAP, but they have different settings, so they don't have a constant pressure, um, which can make them more comfortable for, to wear. People complain less about them. So if you have an individual who can't tolerate a CPAP, um, definitely don't don't stop there. Um, look into some other options. There are lots of options to address sleep apnea, and we do not want to neglect them because of how impairing it is. So now we're going to transition to Dr. Turner, who's going to talk to you about another very common diagnosis among people with intellectual disability. Thank you so much, Dr. Lloyd and Dr. Dizan, and your clear and comprehensive overviews. So I'm going to be speaking today um, kind of touching on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, anxiety disorders, and obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So ADHD is one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders of childhood. It is usually first diagnosed in childhood, but symptoms can certainly last into adulthood. Symptoms of ADHD include difficulty with inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. While many symptoms are common, of these are common to young children, such as you know, having a short attention span or high activity level. The difference is that for those with ADHD, their symptoms are greater than expected for their age, and they cause distress and affect their overall functioning. So ADHD is diagnosed as one of three subtypes. The first is um, hyperactive impulsive subtype. Um, those with um, this type of ADHD are always on the go. They seem as if, as if they're driven by a motor. They may blurt out answers before a question has been finished, have difficulty waiting for their turn, have a hard time staying in their seat. Um, another subtype is the inattentive subtype. So this one is more likely to get diagnosed later in life because symptoms are often not as like externally obvious. Um, although ADHD overall is more prevalent in females, females are more likely to fall in this subtype. So symptoms of this subtype include difficulties staying focused on tasks and activities, such as during lectures or long reading, um, struggling with following through on instructions and completing tasks, having poor time management skills, um, having messy and disorganized work. Sometimes people almost appear not to um, listen than when spoken to. Um, people may forget daily tasks like chores or running errands that need to be done um, and may often lose things that are needed in daily life, such as um, looking you know, for phones or keys or books or their schoolwork. And then the combined subtype is really just um, an uh, individual having symptoms of both of the above. It's unknown what specifically causes ADHD, but it is thought to have a genetic component Although prenatal and environmental factors are likely also increased risk in developing it. For example, um, some research has shown that there is a greater risk to kids that are born prematurely, that have had prenatal exposures to alcohol or tobacco, those with brain injury and lead exposure. And while it is 
you know, typically diagnosed in childhood, there has been increased recognition that symptoms of ADHD can carry over into adulthood for many. However, um, symptoms may be reduced and can sometimes look a little different in adulthood. Below are just a few of the examples of what it can look like in adults. So hyperactivity per se may not be as pronounced in childhood, but can certainly, the, an adult with ADHD can certainly feel internally restless or even engage in fidgeting or pacing behaviors. Um, adults may still have forgetfulness and impulsivity, but it's more noticed now within the context of adult responsibilities. Adults can um, also be excitement and, excitement and stimulation seeking to kind of reduce that feeling of and sense of boredom and may show less um, frustration tolerance. Okay. Um, so ADHD can be underdiagnosed and undertreated in those with intellectual disability. However, it is a very common comorbidity um, with our individuals. There are um, very few studies actually on ADHD and people with intellectual disability, and especially compared to the extensive research for ADHD in the general population. There's, um, you know, um, and there's an, um, excuse me, um, an under recognition of ADHD in people with intellectual disability may contribute to overuse of non ADHD psychotropic medications in people with IDD and challenging behavior. A recent study that was published in June 2019 um, by Al Kuderi and colleagues, they looked at medication practices for those with ADHD and coexisting IDD. It's interesting to note um, that 64% of those with ADHD and IDD who were taking ADHD meds were on an antipsychotic. And this is compared to 93% of those with dual ADHD and IDD who are not on an ADHD medication. And then they were 93% of those were placed on an antipsychotic. So I think it really is important to be aware of the possible presence of ADHD um, and to develop plans that both meet the individual's needs as well as um, reporting symptoms to a prescriber. Essentially, ADHD is an executive function disorder. The term executive functioning was first coined um, in 1970 by Carl Pribram. Executive functioning is the cognitive processes that organize thoughts, activities, they help prioritize tasks, help manage your time efficiently, and help people make decisions. There are a set of skills that are kind of needed to be for somebody to be independent in all areas of their life. So anybody with classic ADHD will have difficulty with all or most of these seven executive functions. Thinking of difficulties in the following areas, I think can really help guide skill building and supports that are needed within the behavior support plan. So just to quickly touch on them, impulse control, um, it's the ability to think before speaking, to think about choices and consequences before acting. Flexible thinking um, is a person's ability to adjust to new situations, to cope with changes, to even switch from one activity to another. Emotional control is the, um, is the ability to regulate emotions and to choose what emotions are most appropriate for any given context. Working memory um, affects a person's um, ability to follow directions or pay attention. Self-monitoring involves a person's kind of self-awareness of what is going on, uh, of how they're doing in the moment, and to just make be able to make adjustments accordingly um, so that their behaviors match the current situation. Planning and prioritizing to be able to um, meet short and long-term responsibilities, initiating tasks, and then you know organizing and keeping track of information and belongings. I really like this chart because I like the pictures depicting some of the good self-care practices for ADHD, which include music and use of laughter and tapping into the creativity and also reducing environmental input when people are feeling oversaturated. Okay. Listed below are some practical strategies to consider when supporting somebody with ADHD. You know, most are self-explanatory, but I will highlight just a few. It's really important that we use statements that tell the person what you want him or her to do, such as, you know, put your feet on the floor, rather than what you don't want him or her to do, such as, you know, put your, don't put your feet on the chair. 
because the latter example it takes more cognitive processing because somebody has to think kind of about what to undo and it still doesn't let the person know what's expected for them to be doing and on top of that it also adds more auditory reinforcement to the statements of what not to do which we definitely don't want to do um, so other things um, include improving organization. This might look like helping the person get in routines, like keeping shoes and keys and important belongings in the same locations. Helping prioritize things, um, you know, going over with an individual, okay, these are the things that we need to take care of this weekend. What are the priorities? Let's start with those. Um, also being able to teach um, kind of a stop, think, and act model. So just working on building the skill of stopping, thinking through possible courses of action, then deciding which one's the best route to go and then, you know, and then and then doing such. But all of these things are important and, um, you know, are there for future reference. Okay. Now I'm going to switch over to anxiety disorders, which are also very common, um, both in those with IDD as well as just the general population. So anxiety disorders include disorders that share features of excessive fear and anxiety and then related behavioral disturbance. So fear is the emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat, whereas anxiety is the anticipation of that future threat. So obviously there's an overlap, but fear is more associated with those surges and autonomic arousal, which is necessary for fight or flight, that thought of immediate danger and then escape behaviors where anxiety is more associated with muscle tension and vigilance and preparation for future danger and kind of cautious or avoidant behaviors. Here's a list of some of the common anxiety disorders that I will quickly go through. These are arranged sequentially in order of typical age of onset. While all anxiety disorders while well, all these are anxiety disorders, they differ from one another in the types of objects or situations that are inducing the fear, anxiety, or avoidant behavior. So the first one is separation anxiety. Um, that involves excessive fear or concern regarding um, somebody being separated from that, that safe space for them, that individual that they're attached to. Selective mutism is um, a consistent failure to speak in social situations in which speaking is um, expected. A specific, a specific phobia, a lot of us are familiar with those. Um, a marked fear or anxiety about a specific object or situation, such as heights or dogs or spiders, or you know, even public speaking. Social anxiety disorder is um, fear and anxiety about social situations in which the person is exposed to possible scrutiny of others. So particularly in situations where the person may be observed or having some kind of performance demand or there's an expectation for social interactions. Panic disorder um, involves recurrent and unexpected panic attacks. Panic attacks are these kind of abrupt surges of intense fear or discomfort that generally reach their peak within minutes, but can certainly be very intense and frightening for an individual. Agoraphobia is the marked fear or anxiety about being outside the home. Things such as using public transportation, being in open spaces, or standing in line or being in a crowd. Generalized anxiety disorder, um, involves excessive worry or anxiety, which occur more days than not over at least a six month period. And it can be on a broad number of events or activities. And then there's also anxiety that can be induced by substances or medications. This next chart, I really like this um, depiction of the cycle of anxiety. Um, things start with an anxiety producing stimuli which then leads us to uncomfortable feelings like worry and rapid heart rate and feeling overwhelmed. These uncomfortable sensations are then controlled by avoiding the situation that's causing the anxiety. For example, you know, skipping class to avoid a presentation or using alcohol to numb your feelings or procrastinating. While this is very effective, it does lead to short-term relief. However, the fear that initially led to the avoidance worsens. And the brain learns that when anxiety producing the situation is avoided, the symptoms go away. So as a result, the symptoms and anxiety will be worse the next time and avoidance is even more likely. The person will also not then have the experience of kind of successfully managing the stress for 
and realize that they could do it, or even maybe it wasn't as bad as anticipated. So that cycle just continues to, to, to um, progress. Okay, just switch over, okay. So now I'm gonna switch over to obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Let's see, obsessive compulsive disorder involves both the obsessions and, compuls and compulsions. So obsessions are the recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are causing distress or anxiety for a person. The compulsions are the repetitive behaviors like hand washing or ordering or checking or mental acts such as praying, counting, repeating words silently that the individual then feels driven to perform in response to that obsession with the goal to reduce anxiety or prevent some kind of dreaded outcome or situation. However, sometimes the compulsions are not always connected in a realistic way with what they're trying to neutralize or prevent and can certainly become clearly excessive. So the specific content of obsessions and compulsions vary, but some of the common themes I wanted to touch on are cleaning. So people can have obsessions around contamination and then engage in various cleaning compulsions. Symmetry, um, obsessions regarding symmetry and then compulsions involving repeating, ordering or counting. Also um, having forbidden or taboo thoughts, particularly around aggressive sexual or religious obsessions and then develop related compulsions to those. And then another common one is harm. Um, people have fears of harming um, oneself or others and start engaging in related checking compulsions. So body dysmorphic disorder is a preoccupation with perceived defects or flaws in your own personal appearance that are very likely not observable to others or um, maybe very slightly observable to others. Um, people who have this then can start doing some repetitive behaviors such as excessive mirror checking or excessive grooming in response. And hoarding disorder, um, it's a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. There is a perceived need for a person to save those items and they may have a lot of distress then when associated with discarding the item even if it's not needed. Trichotillomania is a hair pulling disorder. It's the recurrent pulling of one's hair, which can result in hair loss. It can be any part of the body, but it's most commonly the scalp, the eyebrow, or the eyelids. Just to note that people sometimes engage in repetitive or um, kind of um, ritualistic behaviors sometimes with trichotillomania. So after they pull the hair, they may do some kind of playing ritual with it or even consume the hair. So just be mindful if you have an individual with trichotillomania as to what is happening with the hair, because um, if they're consuming it, that could lead to some medical complications. Excoriation is a skin picking disorder, which is recurrent picking of the skin in different regions. And then the last one is just that I'm gonna touch on is just um, you know, obsessive compulsive behavior that can be during intoxication or withdrawal. Okay. So there's the old joke that some of you guys might already be familiar with is, you know, one person says to another person, you know, why do you put breadcrumbs outside the front door every day? So the other person says, you know, to keep the tigers away. And so person, the first person says, but wait, there are no tigers. Um, so the other person says, yeah, exactly. See, it works, right? So that kind of is, and it, you know, helps kind of highlight the process that can happen with OCD. So while everyone has similar concerns as those with OCD, but those with OCD are really unable to stop those unwanted thoughts from occurring and may even recognize, even if they recognize that they can be irrational. The compulsion often results from trying to get control over your life and the bad circumstances that could happen. But the irony is that then the compulsions can start to control the person. Historically, OCD has been very perplexing to treat. And think about the cycle of anxiety that I talked about earlier. It certainly pertains to OCD behavior as well. Um, it's very challenging to treat because the person can become convinced that the compulsion is what prevented the feared consequence. And what happens is you, then they don't get the experience that it probably wouldn't have happened anyway. So fear can then generalize quickly to other situations leading to further compulsions. Exposure and response prevention has emerged as the gold standard treatment for OCD. This treatment in a nutshell involves exposure to the anxiety um, evoking stimuli and then prevention from engaging in the compulsive ritual. Um, it can definitely be modified to treat those with autism and IDD. 
Um, and while intervention is best when done alongside a clinician or behaviorist, in a simplified form and like a home environment, it may involve um, one, redirecting the, a person back to his schedules or routines. So for example, and say, instead of saying something like, don't stay in the shower for so long, I'm just being able to say like, let's keep on schedule or maybe wash hands only to the happy birthday song or cueing the individual that, you know, he or she can check on things once, but then we need to leave to, to get to where we need to go. So first is that is having, you know, having that piece. And then the second is when the person starts engaging in that repetitive compulsive behavior, immediately redirecting him or her to um, an available alternative activity. And then third is use and teaching of various coping strategies. Okay. Remember, anxiety is very common in those with IDD and autism. Challenging behavior can mask um, anxiety. It is more, it's made even more difficult sometimes to identify anxiety in individuals with IDD because they may not have the language to label and express anxiety directly. So listed um, are just a few strategies to help support an individual with overall anxiety. Um, while I have a bunch of strategies listed below, mo most of them focus on maintaining things like consistency, predictability, structure, and order, helping reassure safety, helping proactively manage stressful situations that you know will be stressful for that individual, allowing control and choices, and also reducing overexposure in media or to conversations within the home around anxiety producing events. And then lastly, um, you know, teaching relaxation and stress reduction strategies is also very helpful. Okay. Just wanted to touch a moment on anxiety for medical procedures and medical appointments. Due to a number of reasons, um, including having a history of needing many medical tests and procedures for um, underlying medical conditions, um, having a lack of understanding and the ability to process what's happening, um, feeling overwhelmed, even just from a sensory perspective while at a medical appointment or with all the medical equipment, um, the need to have repeated blood work or tests for different medications that a person is on or different medical condition, underlying medical conditions they may have. So many of the individuals that we support can have a history of anxiety and even in some cases, um, trauma around medical appointments and other procedures. Below are some strategies um, for successfully supporting the individual with um, anxiety in these situations. Certainly um, moving, having an approach from least to most intrusive is helpful. So maybe starting with blood pressure, moving to moving to um, you know, the stethoscope and heart, and then moving from there to mouth and ears. I think it's really important for people to um, say what they're going to do first and then allow an individual the process processing time before then doing it. Um, you can go through the routine um, that for the a provider appointment prior to the visit. Um, sometimes it's helpful to even check with the provider what's going to happen at the appointment so you can prepare the individual. Minimizing time in the waiting room is also really important. Um, tend to have the most luck with the first appointment of the day, even sometimes the first appointment after lunch break. And then also um, some providers allow, you know, people to circle around in the vehicle, let's say, and then call them in when they're, when they're getting close to their appointment time. Um, bringing familiar um, objects with the person to help them feel comfortable or relax, like headphones or music or little items to do while waiting. And then just in terms of the sensory component, it can be really overwhelming. So from an auditory perspective, you know, just one person talking at a time is really helpful. Um, from a tactile perspective, helping warm up the stethoscope or allowing um, the person to wear their own clothing whenever possible. Also just allowing the person to do what he or she can for himself or herself, like placing, helping the helping the technician place the stickers for the EKG or helping hold it, hold the band-aids. So visual is also, there's a lot of visual stimulation as well within um, appointments. So dimming the lights in the room whenever possible, um, bringing sunglasses to wear, that can be particularly helpful um, for dental appointments. And then pain, pain is really difficult um, and for people to sometimes express. So 
um, people who know an individual really well should communicate with the medical providers as to how he or she expresses pain. So that way they can look for the behaviors that will signal that they are in pain and be just mindful of that. And then it's also helpful to try to reduce pain as much as possible through use of numbing cream or ice to the areas, et cetera. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Racinos who will talk about trauma and personality disorders. Thank you, Dr. Turner, I appreciate that. Hello everyone, thank you for being here um, and for listening to my colleagues. Prior to this, I'm going to be talking, um, as Dr. Turner said, a little bit about trauma and personality disorder. As with all of the other things that have been covered today, this is really just kind of a toe in the water. Um, so if there's more that people want to know about, obviously we can um, put time into it at another um, in, you know, in another meeting. Um, so this is um, this is really just an overview. So. Um, first slide here, I have a couple of um, quotes. Um, one of them, or I'm sorry, both of them are from um, a psychiatrist named Bessel van der Kolk, who is well known in the area of trauma. He's done lots of research um, and is very knowledgeable about how trauma affects our body, how we store it in our body, how it's expressed and so forth. So um, I'm not going to read both of them, but the second one I think really kind of struck me because I, I think it's something that we all need to remember about people with trauma, which is unlike other forms of psychological disorders, the core issue in trauma is reality. So um, when we're dealing with somebody who has had trauma, that has been part of their reality. So it's not a delusion. It's not something they're making up. It's not something that, you know, is just sort of perceived. It's something that that they've experienced truly. So we can move on. Thanks. Um, so what is trauma? In general, it can be defined as a psychological emotional response to an event or an experience that's very distressing or disturbing to the person. Um, that's when it's loosely applied of the trauma definition can occur, can or excuse me, refer to something upsetting like being involved in an accident, illness or injury, losing a loved one or going through a divorce. Those are just some examples. It can also ex encompass far extremes that include experiences that are really damaging, like sexual and physical assault. Um, because the events are viewed subjectively, uh, the broad trauma definition is really more of a guideline. So everyone processes uh, traumatic events differently because we all face them through the lens of any prior experiences that we've had in our lives. And also because trauma reactions fall across a very wide spectrum, categories of trauma have been developed. And among them are complex trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, which most people have heard, of, have heard of as PTSD, and then developmental trauma disorder. And I'm gonna talk about those on the next slide. Thank you. So types of trauma, complex trauma um, is something that happens repetitively. It often results in direct harm to the person, the effects of complex trauma are cumulative, which means that just one thing piles on top of the next. Uh, the traumatic experience frequently transpires within a particular time frame or within in a particular re specific relationship, and it can be in a specific setting. So a very classic and or extreme example could be um, an individual who um, was raised in a home where they were routinely abused on a regular basis, whether it was sexual, physical, emotional. Maybe it always happened at certain times of the day after maybe a certain person, you know, came back into the house after being out for the day. So, um, you know, when we talk about it being repeated and cumulative, that kind of trauma can happen day after day over, over, over the course of many years. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD tends to develop after a person has been exposed to um, what they experience as a terrifying event or has been through an ordeal in which there's been intense physical harm, um, whether that occurred or, or was threatened. And people who suffer from PTSD tend to have persistent and frightening thoughts and memories of their ordeal. And that's to the point where it, it will actually interfere with their ability to function in their lives on a daily basis. Developmental trauma disorder, um, also called adverse childhood experiences, um, is really a recent term in the study of psychology. Uh, the disorder forms in the child's first three years of life, and it tends to be the result of abuse, neglect, abandonment. Um, developmental trauma interferes with the uh, infant or child's neurological, cognitive, and psychological development, and it disrupts their ability to attach to adult caregivers. So when you hear, um, you know, reference to 
um, any kind of a, a disrupted attachment or a reactive attachment disorder, that developmental trauma um, or adverse childhood experience is something that directly relates to having that disrupted attachment. The next slide is going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about developmental trauma because we do see many people in our service that have had some level of this developmental trauma. So developmental trauma is a type of chronic trauma, which means it happens in their daily in the person's daily life versus it being a single event trauma um, where maybe something has happened just just once. Children are at increased risk because they're more vulnerable than adults and tend to to be dependent on their caregivers just because they're kids and the source of uh, so a person's source of comfort is also their source of danger. And this can also be true for individuals with IDD, obviously people who are um, more dependent on on staff or, or even family to give care. Uh, developmental trauma impacts personality development and cognitive emotional resources. So we're going to talk next about personality disorders. This is the kind of trauma that can um, set that course toward personality development that may be disordered um, and also decrease the likelihood that someone's going to have the um, the ability to me mediate their own stress or um, deal with their own emotions and be able to express them in ways that is ad adaptive versus maladaptive. Um, developmental trauma also excuse me, impacts brain development Self-preservation becomes more important than anything else, and developmental trauma also informs trauma responses, whether that's fight, flight, freeze, or submit. Um, I think a lot of people have probably heard of fight, um, fight or flight. Freeze is also part of it, so the person tends not to do anything versus submit, which means, you know, I, I feel like I can't do anything, so this thing is just going to happen to me. And then there's the subsequent shame and hopelessness because I've let this happen to me. Um, so those are those are all trauma based responses that can come directly from developmental trauma. Um, people who have dealt with developmental trauma tend to um, have triggers. Those are responses to signals that are known to represent threats or danger. So maybe that's tied to a particular time of day. Maybe it's you know tied to a particular event. Maybe it's the tone of somebody's voice. Those are the kinds of things that are really important for people who are writing behavior programs, directing people who are giving direct care to understand those kinds, um, you know, the, those situations and what those triggers are. Knowing a person has a history of developmental trauma automatically, what are some of those triggers um, that bring that person into a, um, a place where they they're revisiting their trauma? So. For people with developmental trauma, when danger is detected, and that could be real or imagined danger, um, the fire alarm kind of goes off in their brain and starts a cycle of what's called hyperarousal and hypoarousal. So think about what happens when you hear a fire alarm. You know that there's something wrong. Maybe you don't know exactly where the fire is or what you need to do next, but you know that something is wrong. So your body is going into action, and that's that hyperarousal. So um, you know, very, uh, you know, intent on trying to figure out what I need to next, who's doing what, what's their intention. I have all these feelings. What am I going to do with them? That then goes down to a cycle, or excuse me, the bottom of the cycle, which is hypo arousal, which could be someone who is just not engaged, not able to, you know, deal with their emotions, not even able to name their emotions. They may be in bed for a day or two. Um, they may not want to eat. They may be sleeping all the time. So there's that really turned, you know, turned all the way up hyperarousal to turned all the way down hypoarousal. Um, and that's that's a real cycle that occurs with people who have dealt with developmental trauma. Um, again, when people deal with developmental trauma um, and, and they're going through that hyper and hypoarousal uh, cycle in between, there's something that's called a window of tolerance. Um, that's a uh, phrase that was coined by um, Dan Siegel, MD, and um, relearning can occur. So those are, that's the place where we as behaviorists, psychologists, social workers, whoever it is that that's writing behavior programs or looking at behavior programs, that's the time when we can help somebody figure out what are the skills they need to learn so the next time this, this situation occurs where that fire alarm goes off, 
how can we handle this differently? Some people have a longer window of tolerance than others. People who have developmental, developmental trauma tend to have fairly short ones, so it's up to us to help them try to increase that over time, not something that happens overnight. And last but not least on this slide, um, problem behaviors are generally the person's attempt at, at a solution to deal with whatever it is um, that they're feeling, thinking, um, or experiencing. So for the rest of us who aren't engaging in those problem behaviors, we're the ones calling them problem behaviors, right? <laughs> or the, even the person might think it's a problem because they're not getting what they need. But nine times out of 10, that's developed, that behavior is developed as, as, uh, as a way for the person to get their needs met, even if it's not in the most adaptive way. So we have to respect them for being solutions, and then it's up to us to kind of identify that for the person and then also help them on a change. Oh, sorry about that. I think my, my Wi-Fi cut out for a second. Okay, so trauma and ID. Um, if people, uh, this, this is um, reference material from Karen Harvey. Um, if people have uh, seen her uh, speak, then some of this will sound familiar to you. If you have not, um, you could look up any of her information online um, uh, for trauma-informed interventions with people with ID. So research has shown that people with ID are at greater risk of abuse and neglect than people in the general population. And up to 90% of people with disabilities actually report being victims of abuse on multiple occasions. If you think that sounds high, you're right. Um, however, as few as 37% of people with ID actually report abuse to authorities. So there's a big difference there. And some of the causes for increased risk of trauma of individuals with ID can include difficulty reporting. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I make a report? Um, sometimes people with ID are considered less credible sources. So when you think about why are only 37% of people with ID reporting abuse, that's why. Uh, many people with ID have already gotten the message from uh, reporting agencies or from other professionals or maybe even from peers. We're considered less credible because we have ID. Um, so there can be a greater emphasis sometimes on empathy to caregivers. And while caregivers do um, put out a lot of time, effort and energy and emotional and physical resources to care for people with ID, um, we can't and we don't want to forget that we also can't forget that these are other humans that that they're providing services to so our empathy has to go to both places um, there can also be um uh, there, so an increased risk of trauma for individuals with id can also be attributed to um, increased parental and caregiver stress so generally the greater the disability that the individual um, has can usually equal the more severe physical um, abuse or neglect. So the more care someone needs, unfortunately, the more likely it is um, that they could be severely abused or neglected. Uh, and that can be traced back to the stress that maybe a caregiver or a parent may feel because of that ongoing day by day demand um, for care. Um, another uh, cause of increased risk is what's called social trauma. So that's bullying, name calling. That's not just in school, that could be throughout the person's life. And something important to remember is that that feeling of exclusion, social exclusion, is processed in your brain the same way as physical pain is. So you break your arm, physical pain. You're excluded from, um, from socialization or being accepted socially. Your brain feels that as pain too. And then have, being someone with ID, you have to figure, your brain has to figure out how am I gonna deal with that feeling and the emotions that come with that. And then finally, although not the only, uh, not not the last risk, um, uh, part of risk would be institutionalization and foster care. We know plenty of our individuals that have been in both or either and um, have, have dealt with some level of trauma. Thank you. So some symptoms of trauma, and this is for people with and without ID. So people with IDD can also um, express these symptoms. Shock and denial are pretty typical. Um, over time, perhaps the emotional response may fade, but the person um, can also experience reactions that are long-term. So anger is one. Um, maybe persistent feelings of sadness and despair, perhaps flashbacks to the event. 
unpredictable emotions. So crying, um, you know, being depressed, maybe um, maybe very rageful. Um, physical symptoms like nausea and headaches. Uh, intense feelings of guilt, like they were somehow responsible for what happened to them, perhaps an altered sense of shame, and then feelings of isolation and hopelessness. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just um, a list of some very um, typical symptoms of trauma. Um, so the, okay, well, I wanna talk a little bit about treatment of trauma and trauma-informed care approaches. So, holy cow, I didn't realize how small I made that. I'm going to make that bigger for myself. OK, so the first little uh, that blue square there, um, it, this is specifically uh, about trauma informed care, and that's an approach to in the human service field um, that is going to assume that a person more than likely has a history of trauma or trying to provide support for, support for them versus treating symptoms. We're not looking for them to tell their whole story from, you know, DNA to that afternoon. We want to avoid re-traumatization and constantly, you know, asking for storytelling. So there's six core principles um, in trauma-informed care. One of them is safety. The, um, the next one is trustworthiness and transparency, and that's for us as providers. We want to be seen as trustworthy and transparent so we can, ex we can expect the same back from the person. Um, peer support and mutual self-help, so being able to hook people up um, with peers and other people who have self-identified as perhaps trauma survivors so that they can learn from each other. Um, collaboration and, wow, I wish I could read that. And Mutuality, <laughs> I think it says, <laughs> or I'm sorry, is that what it says? Yes. Um, so being able to collaborate with the person, it's just what it says. We need to be able to work with them. We're not writing reports or um, behavior programs for them without their input, input and without their, um, you know, without their contribution. Um, the next is uh, empowerment, voice, and choice. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We want to make sure that, you know, the person feels like they're in control um, of, of interventions if they feel they need them or any kind of treatment um, or even simple things like what they're doing during the day. Because as you can imagine, people who deal with trauma have absolutely had that their choice is taken away if something has happened to them. And then finally, we have um, cultural, historical, and gender um, related issues. So we always want to take into account um, all of those, all, all the pieces of who the person is. We're looking at them holistically, not just some person with ID that trauma happened to, but how does their culture look at the trauma and their ID? Um, you know, how does, how is that looked at in historical context through their life and, and also um, in terms of their gender as well and what, uh, you know, how they self-identify. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back really quick. I missed the second part of that slide. Whoops. OK, <laughs> sorry. Um, so the triangle on the bottom. Um, so Karen Harvey, who I had mentioned uh, previously, uh, she specifically uh, writes and speaks about trauma informed interventions with for people with ID. Those include key elements of safety and connection and empowerment, very much similar to trauma informed care. Her, her intervention has grown out of classic trauma informed care. And the pyramid to the left um, is something that she uses. It's a behavioral pyramid. She uses that visual in many of her presentations, um, meaning that um, if you kind of look at the triangle as, um, say, uh, you know, an iceberg. It behavior is the tip of the iceberg. It's just what we're seeing. So it's our job to kind of dig down to figure out what's the emotion that's connected to that behavior and what's the trauma, or maybe not specifically what the exact trauma is, but to acknowledge that trauma is perhaps could be the thing that's driving the emotion. If the person wants to tell their story, they're able to, and if not, simply acknowledging that trauma exists um, for the person and it drives their emotion and behavior um, is key. Thank you. Sorry about that. OK, so additional treatments to address trauma. Um, EMDR, which I'm sure some people have heard of, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, it's used for PTSD, it focuses on memory, and the intent, um, intent is to change the way that memory is stored in the brain. And so that would eliminate, the, the theory being that eliminates uh, or and or reduces problematic symptoms. That has been shown to be um, you know, effective in, in uh, through research. 
So during EMDR therapy, um, observations suggest that there is an accelerated learning process that's simulated by EMDR. Um, and there's very standardized procedures. Actually, the little picture on the left on the bottom of the woman that's doing this is um, part of something that uh, occurs during EMDR. There's particular uh, hand movements that go with the eye movements. Um, so there's an incorporation of the use of eye movement and other forms of ryth rhythmic left right stimulation. Um, the person focuses briefly on the trauma memory and then simultaneously experiences that what's called bilateral stimulation. Um, and then the vividness and emotion of the memory are supposed to be reduced. Uh, another treatment is called at art or accelerated resolution therapy, not the kind we were drawing, although that's good too. It has many similarities to EMDR. Um, it fosters rapid recovery um, and then reprogram pre programming how the brain stores traumatic uh, memories and imagery. It tends to be less verbal and it relies more on memory visualization techniques. It's informed by um, cognitive behavior therapy, exposure therapy, and guided imagery, and all of those um, in their own right so could certainly be used to address trauma. And some medication considerations because people always ask about that. So um, first thing I want to say is there is no one medication for PTSD. There is no such thing. Um, but different classes and different types of medications could be used um, for you know, different presenting symptoms. So we have what's called SSRIs and SNRIs. Those, those could be used for possibly for depression and anxiety. I name a few there. MAOIs um, may be used as an antidepressant and can also focus on panic and social phobia, which could be related to the trauma. Um, antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics may be used sometimes for sleep, sleep nightmares, flashbacks, or even intrusive thoughts. Beta blockers could be used for hyperarousal. So remember we talked about hyper, um, hyper and hypo um, you know, stimulation. A beta blocker could possibly be be useful for times of hyperarousal, and then sometimes people will use, <clears throat> excuse me, benzodiazepines, but those tend to worsen symptoms for people with trauma diagnoses. Not always, but literature does suggest that that's probably the least useful of of medication classes. Okay, so that's it for trauma. I'm just going to jump into personality disorder. Thank you. you can move to the next one. Great. Um, again, I'm not going to read both of these. Um, I uh, one of them, the first uh, quote is just really about what personality is, and it's from a book that I would absolutely um, recommend to anybody. It's by a woman named Zilla Webb. It's called Intellectual Disabilities and Personality Disordered and Integration and Integrated Approach. If you have manuals and other books, um, you know, about IDD and personality disorder and you don't have this one, it's a very good um, addition this is not a paid endorsement fyi um and then the uh the next um quote is directly from the dsm that talks specifically about what the dsm-5 considers a personality disorder and you can read that at your leisure okay so uh personality disorders that are listed in the dsm-5 um if anybody's perused the dsm they know that uh that they are broken up into clusters so we're just going to go through those really quickly so cluster a which are considered odd disorders um, because of the the presentation of the individual there's a paranoid personality disorder which um, is the hallmarks are irrational mistrust and suspicion um, so there's no reason why the person may need to be need to be suspicious or mistrustful that's that's the core of, of how they perceive the world um, <coughs> excuse me uh, schizoid personality disorder. The person is detached from social relationships and tends to um, have very re a restricted range of emotion. Um, schizotypal uh, personality disorder. The person has very odd beliefs and um, is very is, is has discomfort in interacting socially. So um, aside from just being detached, they actually have almost no enjoyment of of having any kind of social contact. This is like the the, the person who's kind of the ultimate hermit. Um, cluster B, dramatic emotional or erratic disorders. Chances are we see most of the people that we see are mostly from that cluster B. 
Um, so the first kind is histrionic, so the person's very attention seeking and they can be very excessive in their emotions. Um, kind of over, people might call them over the top. Um, narcissistic, so the person is very grandiose. They tend not to be empathic. Everything is about them. Antisocial um, personality disorder, the individual tends to be exploitative. They disregard the rights of others. Um, they may even stray into the area of psychopathy, which is lack of empathy, deviance, criminal behavior. Um, and then borderline personality disorder, which is um, marked by an inst instability in relationships, identity, and emotions. And then finally, cluster C, which are anx anxious or fearful disorders. So dependent personality, there's an excessive need for caring and reassurance by others. Um, avoidant, the person socially inhibited and sensitive to negative evaluation more than more than any, you know, an, another person might be. Um, and obsessive compulsive, so the person's very rigid, controlling and perfectionistic. But before, before we leave the slide, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, you know, I I was interested in trying to find out what is the prevalence really of people with personality disorders who are also diagnosed with IDD. So the range, it turns out, is from 0.7 to 35%, which is kind of a big range, right? Um, and there isn't a ton of research to say, um, you know, it, to speak specifically on people with ID um, and personality disorder. So it's, it's kind of still a young field, um, but, uh, we, I, I would imagine there's probably some some underreporting of it. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. OK, so. So some individuals with intellectual disabilities certainly show what's called um, enduring patterns of uh, an inner experience and behavior that constitute personality disorder. And I, I underlined enduring pattern because that is really one of the, you know, the takeaways from the DSM-5 is the person that this has to be happening all the time in in you know basically all environments and um it, it regardless of what's happening what's going on um, many people with id who show problem behaviors don't automatically have a personality disorder so it's really important that there's a possibility that individual may have a personality disorder um when you're when you're assessing problematic behavior. So being able to take a look at that, maybe talk to a clinician, talk to the psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, somebody who's familiar with with doing those kinds of diagnoses to kind of tease that out instead of automatically saying, oh, that person's borderline, because I hear that a lot. Um, so there's individual with ID may also have a personality disorder if they show a range of severe persistent problems with managing their own behavior and relating to other people. So that's kind of like a breadcrumb for Hmm, we may have a, there may also be a, a co-occurring, um, you know, uh, personality disorder here, but again, a larger conversation with a clinician would probably be very useful. Next slide, there you go. Um, so, so there's some problems that are experienced by people with ID and personality disorder. Lots of similarities to people who don't have ID and also have personality disorders, but these tend to be fairly common for um, for people who have um, the dual diagnosis. So um, an unhealthy self image and low self esteem, um, emotional distress, so very intense and changeable emotions, interpersonal difficulties, <clears throat> excuse me, difficulties with self control and impulsivity that can in include substance use and offending behavior. Um, and that could go back to the antisocial personality disorder. Very black and white thinking, what we call distorted thinking, problems with physical health and poor treatment compliance. I'm fine. I don't need to take my meds. I don't care if I'm, you know, I have problems with uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. Co comorbid mental health problems, so maybe depression and anxiety. Behaviors that um, can be challenging, like verbal and physical aggression, suicidal behavior and self-harm. <clears throat> Excuse me. People who are in frequent crises. So these are the people that are going to the ER all the time. Um, maybe their uh, their placements or their um, where they are residentially change a lot because they just they can't maintain where they are. The people who are caring for them can't maintain them. Um, difficulty engaging in services um, or following up on appointments, creating tension or disagreement within and between teams. People love to call that splitting. 
sure could it be um but <laughs> it's not helpful i don't think to use that label um but they're very good at, at being able to get people at odds with each other and then finally complex family and relationship networks um they may know they may have people in their lives that they feel are very important but maybe that person is abusive or exploited to them um and may actually uh, not be helpful to them when they want to try to um, you know access services that that could help them thank you so finally some treatment approaches for personality disorders again this is a short list this is by no means um all inclusive so there's cognitive behavior therapy or cbt um treat the treatment premise is that there's thoughts and feelings and behaviors and they're all interconnected and changing negative thoughts about yourself about the world about others um could also change unwanted behavior problems um, then there's DBT or dialectical behavior therapy, which I'm sure many of you have, have heard of. Um, it's a modified type of CBT. It was created by Marshall Linehan um, initially as a therapy for people who engaged in uh, parasuicidal and self-harm behavior. The main goals are to teach people how to live in the moment, develop healthy ways to cope with stress, regulate their emotions, and then improve their relationships. Um, it has been adapted for use with with people with other diagnoses and, and different age groups of so substance abuse, ID, teens, couples, etc. Um, then there is another kind of iteration of, of DBT, which is um, created by Julie Brown. It's a, it's a emotion regulation skills um, system for cognitively challenged uh, clients, and it's DBT informed, as I said. And it teaches core emotion regulation and also adaptive coping skills to individuals with IDD of all ages. Um, so D, uh, just FYI, DBT and um, Julie Brown's emotion regulation skills, those are manualized uh, treatment. Uh, they have manualized treatment options. And those manuals, you can get them on Amazon if you want to. Um, you know, familiarize yourself well with the information, obviously, and then the theories behind them before using them, but um, they are very useful. And then medications, I just wanted to say very briefly, there are no specific FDA approved medications for treating personality disorders. There is no such thing. Um, if meds are used, um, they may help with symptoms associated with um, PD, like depression, uh, mood fluctuations, or transient psychosis and anxiety. Um, and that's something obviously to talk with a psychiatrist about, but there is no medication that's going to uh, full on address a personality disorder. That's it. Those are our references, if anyone cares. Um, some of the slides have references on them, and then these are just um, references in general, correct, Dr. Lloyd? That's right. Thank cool. you. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Christina. So we, we went just a little over. Um, sorry about that, but we um, did want to give you the chance if there's a specific uh, question that you have, you know, feel free to ask. And then if you'd like to ask it, um, you know, by email, that's fine. Or if you'd like to submit to this link I just posted, you can, you know, enter any feedback or any questions and it would be anonymous that way. So totally up to you, but we will um, be posting the full presentation um, recording as well as the PowerPoint on the DDS website. So we'll get that out to everybody um, so you can access it and reference it as needed. Um, so as we close, um, if anyone has a specific question they'd like to ask, feel free to ask now. I am monitoring the chat in case there's anything there. Thank you, Kai. And thank you, Sayeda. Thank you all. And Eric. Yes, thank you to everyone. Appreciate your attention and your time. Let's turn off the today. We overwhelm people with information.